Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's event, Release Perfect Apps with Mobile Visual Testing in the Cloud. My name is Adi, and I'm the event's moderator. First of all, I just want to make sure the sound is working. So if you can hear me OK, please use the raise your hand option in the control panel on your right. So please show of hands if you can hear me OK. OK, I see a lot of hands raised, so this means the sound is working. Great. OK, so today's event features two test automation experts, Adam Kaumi, co-founder and VP R&D of Apply Tools, and Vila Veiko Helpi, head of demand generation at TestDroid. And just before I hand over the microphone to Adam, uh, just a bit of administrative stuff, feel free to ask questions during the webinar. You can do that in the GoToWebinar control panel on your right. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the Q&A session at the end. But if we don't, after the webinar, we'll email you a personal answer. So worthwhile asking. Code examples will be shown. So we suggest minimizing the control panel so you can see the, the entire screen. The webinar is recorded and will be made available for on-demand viewing. A link to it will be emailed to all of you tomorrow. For optimal viewing experience, we also strongly recommend you close off any unnecessary apps running in the background. And if you encounter any technical issues, please send me a private message in the chat room, also in the control panel, and I will try to take care of it as soon as possible. So let's kick off. Adam, the stage is yours. Thank you, Adi. Um, I had some trouble hearing you. Can you please confirm that you can hear me okay before I begin? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on releasing perfect apps with mobile visual testing in the cloud. Uh, we have a lot to cover today. As far as the agenda goes, we'll start with an introduction to visual testing. I'll explain what visual testing is and why it should be automated. Then we'll see a demo of running visual regression tests on a mobile application running on a local emulator. Uh, after that, I will hand it over to Vila, which will tell you all about testing apps, games, and web apps with Testroid. And immediately following that, we'll show another demo of running a cross-device visual test with a device in the Testroid cloud. And of course, we'll have time at the end to answer any questions that you may have during the webinar. So what is visual testing? It is a quality assurance activity aimed to verify that a graphical user interface appears correctly to users. This goes beyond the traditional functional testing that you used to do with tools like Selenium and Appium, where you actually test the functionality of the application through the UI. What we're focusing on here is making sure that the UI itself appears correct to the end user. We want to make sure that each UI element appears in the correct color, shape, position, and size, that it doesn't overlap or hide any other UI elements. This type of testing has become increasingly difficult to perform in recent years, mainly because of the explosion in the amount of uh, operating systems, screen resolutions, uh, form factors, uh, browsers, and devices that applications are expected to run on today. In this slide, you can see an example of a visual test that we found in the Microsoft Azure management portal. You can see here how the graph uh, exceeds the expected bounds of the page. This is an example from Twitter, and you can see here how the uh, timestamp of the notification overflows uh, to overlap the notification below. And it happens again here at the bottom of the page. And this is how the Amazon website looked like for a few hours for certain customers on Amazon Prime Day a few months ago. Now, I'm sure that you've all seen these types of bugs before, and you're familiar with them, and you understand their severity. Uh, they can be uh, embarrassing and hurtful to the company brand, but uh, in many uh, situations, they can actually completely cripple an application or website and end up costing a lot of money, as probably happened in this case. So why should you automate uh, visual testing? Uh, there are many reasons, but the most important one is that the test matrix is just too big to cover manually. 
think of all the different web browsers, devices, operating system, and screen resolutions that your application is expected to run on. We all know that if a uh, website looks good on Chrome, doesn't mean that it would look good on Safari or IE. And if an application looks good on a widescreen, doesn't mean that it would look good on a, on a smartphone. So basically, we have to test across all these different environments in order to make sure that there are no visual issues. Uh, and this takes a lot of time to perform annually. If our application is responsive, and most uh, modern applications are, then you also need to factor in the different layout modes that the application supports. If it's localized to other languages, then you need to factor in the different images and texts and fonts and resources that are related to each language. And of course, even if you don't change a line of code in your application or website, there are still third-party upgrades that can cause visual bugs. A common example is a web browser that, that uh, upgrades every uh, few weeks and you have no control over it, but every time it upgrades, it can introduce incompatibilities with your application or website and cause visual bugs. When it comes to mobile applications, quality is even more critical. The main reason is that it's much harder to roll back changes. So if you have a bug in production, you're stuck with it for some time. You cannot push daily to the App Store, and even if you manage to find a way to work around it, frequent updates take battery and data and uh, eventually upset your customers. Um, in general, there is a much higher quality bar for mobile apps simply because mobile users are less tolerant to UI and UX bugs. And of course, what makes this problem more complicated is the constant pressure to shorten the release cycles. Companies that are practicing continuous deployment today, which is the recent hype, are releasing code to production several times a day. And with such short release cycles, there is hardly any time to perform any type of manual testing, let alone making sure that your app looks right on such a huge uh, variety of uh, execution environments. So how do visual uh, testing tools work? Um, the process is, is very simple. It has four steps. In the first step, um, you take screen, you navigate through uh, the application that you're testing, and you take screenshots. In the second step, the tool takes those screenshots and compares them with baseline images. These images dictate and define the expected uh, appearance of the application. In the third step, the tool uh, generates a report that includes all the uh, screenshots that were taken, the baseline images, and any differences that were found during the test runs, if any were found. And in the fourth step, a tester has to look at the report and decide for each change, if there are any, uh, whether this change is a bug, in which case he opens a bug, or if it's a valid change because you just uh, added a feature or upgraded a component or whatever, in which case, the tester approves the new screenshot, so it would be used as a baseline for subsequent tests. Um, of course, there is the special case when you're running a test for the first time, you still don't have a baseline to compare against. In that case, the first run sets the baseline for you, so starting from the second run and onwards, you always have some baseline to compare against. Now that we know how uh, automated visual tests work. Let's see a demo. We'll run, we'll run a visual regression test on an application that uh, runs on uh, a mobile application that runs on a Genymotion emulator on my local machine. We'll use Appium, or more specifically, the Java language binding of Appium to drive the application. And we'll use Applitool's eyes to perform uh, the visual validation part. The application that we'll use for the demo is the BitBar sample application. It's a very simple application. When you start it, it shows you a question. You have to choose between one, one of three uh, answers. You enter your name, and you click the Answer button. And when you do that, you move to a second uh, screen that tells you whether you answered correctly. So a very simple application. Let's run. Let's see the test and run. OK, so here is our Java test. Uh, we started by um, deciding on an application name, test name, and device name. In this case, it's BitBar Sample App as the application name. The name of the test is, is my answer correct? And the device is Google Nexus 4. These are just strings that will appear in the Applitools uh, test report. And they have no uh, relation, 
necessary relation to the actual names of the artifacts of the device or the, uh, the application itself. Next, we set up Appium. We pointed to the APK file that we want to load. It's an Android uh, application in this case. And we also de define the device, the name of the device that we want to test. Next, we create an Android driver. And uh, what this will do is it will it actually load the APK and uh, start running the application. So after this line, we already have the first screen displayed on the device. Next, we set up the Eyes SDK. This is uh, an SDK that is specific to uh, Appium and or Selenium uh, in Java. There are many, many SDKs for various frameworks other than, uh, than uh, Appium, which you can easily download from the Appium Tools website. Um, after creating the instance of the ISSDK, SDK, uh, you set your API key that you get when you create your free account. And uh, if we move on to the test, uh, you start the test by calling Eyes Open and signaling to the Eyes server that you are starting a test. You provide the Appium driver. You provide the application name and test name. And at this point, we already have the, the initial screen displayed on the device, and we just validate it by calling eyes check window. When we do that, uh, the eyes SDK takes care of getting the screenshot and validating it, covering the entire page at, one, at once, including all the elements within it. So you get full coverage, full visual, and any functionality that is available on the screen displayed is covered with just one line of code, and it saves you from writing hundreds of equivalent uh, lines of uh, test code that you would otherwise had to write, and also, of course, no need to maintain them moving forward. After we've validated the initial screen, we are using Appium to detect the element that has the, uh, the answer that we want to choose, use Testroid Cloud by its text, and click it. Then we um, um, we find the text box uh, we, where we enter the name and we send using the keywords the keys. In this case, it's my name, Adam. And then we hide the keyboard. And then we do another check window. So we see how the first page is already filled with our selection, with our selected answer and my name. Later on, we find the answer button by searching for the answer text. And we click it, which moves us to the second screen. And then we validate it with another and the third call to eyes check window. At the end of the test, we call eyes closed. So let's run the test and see what happens. And move to our emulator. You can see it's a Google Nexus 4. The application started. We found and click the uh, use test red cloud answer. We click the text box, entered Adam, and now clicking the answer. And we got to the second uh, screen. OK, and the test completed. You can see that it passed. If we go to the Applitos uh, dashboard, you can see that we have a new test result with the Bitbar sample app application name and is my answer correct test name and it is marked as passed. If we click it, we drill down and see much more information. Uh, what you see here right now is that we have a timeline at the bottom that shows us the three validation points that correspond to the three check windows that we did in the test. And uh, they are all marked green, indicating that no differences were found. And you can see also that for each validation point, you have two images. On the left-hand side, you have the baseline image. And on the right-hand side, you have the, the screenshots that we're validating. And uh, you can see also that both of them were taken from the same device. Um, one thing that's very nice about this report is that you can actually play back the test inside the Apple Tools dashboard. And when you do that, you can actually see all the clicks that took place and all the text that was entered in up with Appium uh, as the test went by. And this is a very, very effective uh, and concise way to keep reports of your test uh, because they're always available to you. They're never deleted. And it's just a URL that you can place in your bug report. And everyone in the team 
can go and look at the tests even if they don't have access to the application, they don't know where the tests are, they don't know how to code, or they don't know how to read the log files. So there's not much more we can show here because we don't have any differences in this case. So let's simulate the difference so we see how it looks like. I'm just going to change the text here and just uh, put in a typo in my name and I'll run it again. Okay, we're starting. Clicking the second answer. Typing the name with a typo. And clicking answer. And you can see that the typo appears in this screen as well, over here. Okay, so as we would have expected, this test has failed. You can see that uh, eyes close over here through an exception. It indicates that the test has failed, and the URL of the exception points to, uh, and the, the subject of the ex exception contains a URL that leads directly to the test report. So this would end up in your, uh, in your own reports, in your Jenkins server, or whatever means that you have to run your automated tests. And with the click of a button, you can get to the report in the API Tools dashboard to see what happened. If we refresh uh, the list, you can see that we have a test run of the same test, but it's failed right now. And when we zoom in, it immediately takes us to the difference, which is highlighted in pink. And if I toggle between the baseline image and the actual image, you can see uh, that it captured the fact that we have a typo here. Um, we just, uh, so another thing that uh, is important to show is that here on the toolbox, we have this radar button that allows us to highlight the differences. So if there are small ones, we won't miss them. And it's very easy also to navigate between, uh, between the different differences and zoom in and zoom out to see them effectively and address them. Um, right now, we run the test with strict uh, match level. As the name implies, strict matching performs an extremely strict comparison of the images, of the baseline image and the screenshot. Uh, but what's nice about it is that it, it works just like a human looks at the image. It requires no calibration whatsoever to the sensitivity of the match, uh, no uh, thresholds or uh, accuracy ne uh, calibration needed. The rule is that if a human being can see the difference, then it is highlighted, and if you cannot see the difference, then the difference will be ignored. And it has nothing to do, uh, completely unrelated, with the size of the difference or the size of the images that are being compared. So, for example, if we have a very big web page, uh, strict matching can detect a difference between a comma and a period, or a plus symbol and a minus symbol, although they are only a few pixel different. Uh, on the other hand, if on that uh, web page you have a web table, an HTML table, and one of the columns gets to be one pixel wider, which often happens, and this pushes the rest of the page one pixel to the side, which can result with a 70% pixel-wise difference between the images, still this one pixel shift is completely invisible to a human, and the algorithm is smart enough to detect that, and it won't report this type of change, although it is massive pixel-wise. Um, when you are working with strict matching, uh, you, you often get uh, data that is dynamic, such as dates, or ads, or usernames that are different, or times, or just some output that uh, you don't control, and you don't want your test to fail for that. So it's very easy to drag and ignore region from the toolbox and just mark the area that is dynamic so it would be ignored. Uh, just by doing that, you ignore that area when performing the comparison and it will not fail your test. Another way to handle dynamic data is actually matching using a different match level. Uh, for instance, uh, comparing uh, images by their layout or structure. 
you can see that when I chose the different match level, the difference between the difference caused by the typo is no longer highlighted. The reason is that this change does not affect the uh, layout or structure of the page, and so it is consistent and the, and the difference is not highlighted. Layout matching is extremely powerful uh, for two purposes. First of all, it allows you to handle extremely dynamic applications and visually test them. On the other hand, it also helps you perform cross-device uh, tests, as I will show you in the last demo. Just to show you how layout can handle a dynamic application, I'll show you a different example with a Twitter application. So what you can see here is that I have a Twitter uh, application that can have varying uh, tweets, and uh, they have different images and different tweets in them. But still, there are a few violations that were detected. The first one is that the baseline image dictates that the paragraph should be aligned to the right of the image, but it's being violated on the right-hand side. The second one is that we have an image that is expected according to the baseline image, but it is missing here. And if we use the radar, you can see that all these differences are highlighted. Then again, if I toggle between the image, uh, the screenshot and the baseline image, you can see that the two tweets in the middle, although they have different images and different uh, paragraph sizes, uh, they are not highlighted as different because they are structurally equivalent. So it's a very powerful way to do um, uh, visual testing of dynamic applications. With this, I conclude the first demo, and I, I'll hand it over to Ville to tell you more about the Testroid Cloud. Just make your presenter. It will take me a minute. Go ahead, Ville. All right. Thanks, Adam. That was a great. Uh, inside to visual testing. So my name is Ville Vekko Helpi and uh, next 20 minutes I'm, I'll be focusing on uh, what testing actually means on a cloud and uh, basically what test automation is really about when you're using real devices and real browsers. And at the end we, we also have a demo basically the same setup uh, running on, on our devices at uh, Tetroid Cloud. So first thing first, um, if you're not familiar with Testroid, so basically we have a product that can be deployed in three different ways. Uh, Testroid Cloud is probably the most uh, visible product we have. We host thousands of different devices over there. Uh, there's approximately 500 unique Android models currently running, and it's all hosted on our site. So it provides really great foundation for any app developers to test on real devices, and if you need any time of the day, 24-7 access to these devices. So Tetra Cloud is a public cloud and provides provides those device accesses for you. Tetra Enterprise is a product that actually is set up on on-premises where you can actually build your own device cloud. If you have own devices and, and you want to keep everything testing internally, you know, it's a heavily on Jenkins-based product. Uh, typically we have 300, uh, sorry, 30 to 500 different devices uh, used in this kind of setup. So it's really a big uh, device lab of its own. And then we also have a private cloud which basically meets, mean, means a uh, dedicated devices for your needs. So we are hosting those and they are only dedicated for you. It, not only devices but there is also network, VPN, everything. So it's just like a device on your desk but we are, we are maintaining and upgrading and hosting all those devices for you. That's in a nutshell. Um, I pulled these metrics from last year, so 2015, um, we got 117 million uh, device runs at Tetra Cloud. It's a tremendous number of uh, different tests executed on these devices. A lot of apps, games, but also some web testing going on. There was approximately 7.5 million test cases used when these were tested. Android pretty much dominated, but we saw very strong quarter, the fourth quarter for iOS to grow. and there was an obvious reason for that. I mean, there was a big year in terms of OS releases from both Apple and Google. So, um, you know, people typically want to test these kind of setups when, when uh, new versions come out. So 
So what's really the value of uh, cloud testing? So it's not really only about those devices. Of course, they are available 24-7 uh, for your use. But there's a lot of other things as well. The infrastructure, you, typically those need a lot of servers, hardware, additional stuff. Um, so basically, you don't need to make any investment if you are using that kind of uh, public cloud setup. There's also support that we basically maintain and help each and every test run and case where you actually run those tests on our devices. So we have really good support in all these levels. We provide the um, uh, you know quick answers on all questions and of course main maintaining the uh, environment with our operations. Plus of course there's a tools integration. So we we took the open approach from the beginning. So there's really no vendor technology or tools login. Uh, there are a bunch of different kind of um, integrations that you can have with the, or what kind of environment you are actually using and developing, you can use with Tesla Cloud. Apple Tools is a fantastic example. You have, uh, we'll show you in the demo how, how actually the integration that Adam just showed on an emulator works actually on a Tesla Cloud. So basically you have the three different options when you, as a user, you move from local environment to the cloud and test on cloud where devices are resided. So in a local environment, you, you of course, you have a different set of development and testing tools. You have test automation frameworks you probably use. Uh, we're gonna focus on Appium and Selenium in, in this webinar. You also may have a Jenkins uh, or other CI, CD systems running. But when you actually move to the cloud, you have a free option. So you can remotely access any of our devices. That means you manually come in and you select the device you want for a session and you just start using it. Another option is more intelligent. I mean, it really provides the power of test automation and, and it gives instant uh, accessibility and, and possibility to run on even hundreds of devices at the same time. So we are not limiting the test automation anyway. Basically, you can access um, a number of different devices. You can build device groups for yourself and just by one click get your APK or IPA running on these devices. Third option is the integrated REST API. If you have a sophisticated um, build systems or internal setups, you can integrate it, everything uh, through the API to our devices. This is basically, of course, everybody's seen this, but you know how Android fragmentation looked last year. So we're really uh, proud of the uh, supporting 95% of this volume that actually Android, um, you know, is out there globally. Uh, we we focus also not only those devices, but we want to make sure that there is as versatile offering. Uh, of different operating systems available on these devices as possible. So in that front as well, we are pretty much 95% uh, or more than 95% covered. This is again some statistics from our um, Tesla Cloud. So as, as I mentioned that, you know, last year was a significant uh, in terms of operating system upgrades and releases. So as you can see, when mm. either Apple or Google um, actually does a release of, of their iOS or Android, there seems to be more problems related on those versions. And when they have a, another sub-version released, it's getting better. It looks pretty much like this in both iOS and Android. And when, when you have, again, new major release coming, it looks again like this. So you have a lot of new APIs, you have a lot of new setups you have, need to hook on and some of the applications are built for certain API level or certain with having certain features and services available. So it causes a lot of headache for developers. And how you can how you can overcome of that, of course, is that you test on the latest, but also on the some of the oldest ones as well. Okay. So this again shows some of the statistics, and this really for for Android. So what what causes apps to fail? Approx 55% of those are hardware related. So as Adam showed, there's uh, different uh, display tricks you might see on those devices. Some of them have bigger resolution. Your app may not scale well there, or they might not might not scale well on some of the devices. So display is one of those is uh, root causes for that. Sensors are, of, of course, some of the um, one of the um, problem 
for, for especially game developers, but also app developers. If your app is um, sensor sensitive or it needs sensors, uh, these things can cause you issue. Surprisingly, also chipset is is you know tremendous here. It it actually causes a lot of issues. So not all the silicon are built the same way. On the software side, I mentioned the OS flakiness, and approximately the 17% of the issues are caused by the uh, base version of the operating system. But then we also have this OEM customization that really break uh, some of the releases and and especially the app behaviors. On, on those devices. So when OEMs introduce their own UI layers, middleware, drivers, or anything customized, some OEMs even drag their legacy stuff uh, with the Android. So that causes a lot of issues. We really believe that uh, <clears throat> real devices are really must to have. Kind of one um, one thing you need really need to do is to test on those devices because you you can cannot simply test the um, some of the user experience stuff some usability issues with the, what people might see on your app. But of course, there's a hardware, software, and infrastructure point of view. So I mean, if you're running on an emulator, you're pretty much running on x86 environment with software that's actually running on a laptop or a server machine. And it doesn't include any OEM customization. And it's it's really good rule of thumb to remember that nobody really uses emulator to run your app. So you really need to focus on, on getting that tested on a real device. These are probably the top five pain points for any app developer. So fragmentation, as discussed, that's that causes a lot of headache. But also, when it, when we look at the, some of the uh, financial terms, like you know, really low quality apps means un, uninstall instantly when when people don't want to play that kind of crashy or buggy applications. And of course, they lose money for their uh, developers. Manual testing is also kind of slow. Uh, it cannot be really done efficiently. If you need to support hundreds of different devices, manual testing is not an option. And then, of course, device acquisition. How you can access all those different devices if you are target on the other side of the world, um, different markets, you need to access those devices. So in this kind of case, for example, this cloud testing environment provides really great foundation, and you can acquire devices pretty quickly. So how the manual and how to automation look like? They are like pretty much like funnels. When you do manual testing, you need you need a lot of human to do that testing actually, and you can cover less by by humans. Uh, of course, there's more more money burned, time wasted, and when we as a humans do that, it's error prone as well. In automation, what one person can build a test script, run it in one device, and multiply that test on hundreds of different devices. So it's very efficient. And that's what really the test automation is all about. I'm going to focus here a bit on Appium, um, or Selenium, if you will. Um, there's tons of other frameworks out there as well. And uh, really, there isn't really a um, um, right answer what frameworks or what framework works you the best. Uh, if you are interested to um, know a bit more about these frameworks, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to um, happy to share some of my knowledge and some of my information we have, what kind of uh, frameworks actually work best for certain type of apps or games, mobiles, mobile web stuff. So let's look at this, how Appium actually works in the cloud context with real devices and real browsers. So we introduced two different models with Appium. So there's so-called client-side and server-side execution. Client-side basically means that you run the test script on your local host, or maybe your local device, uh, but when you access a device from our Tetra Cloud, you basically um, send the application to Tetra Cloud where it actually gets installed, and then you run that test script on your local machine. It may be a bit slower compared to the uh, server-side execution, uh, but a lot of people do that, and it's it comes really from the Selenium background. So, so if you are used to use Selenium for web testing, Appium works pretty much the same way when you when you run it on a local host. The server side of thing, things are that you basically upload the application, but you also upload the test script over there on our test for cloud, and everything is executed over there. You can review the results, logs, screenshots, everything over there on our our end, 
and you don't have to maintain anything, nothing on your end. No need for development tools, no scripts, nothing. Everything, of course, you, you can build the test scripts over there, but then you upload it to the test, test or cloud. So how this client side of things work? So as we sh uh, as we saw an example that Adam showed, um, design capabilities uh, coming from the Selenium Foundation, um, you configuration things there, device, what type of device it is, what what's your application, what's the app, app package, activity, and so on. And then you have a web driver, basically that um, touches that local environment using the local port and dev maybe device or emulator, and basically uh, doing all that in your local environment. When you are moving from local environment to test road, you basically define few steps in uh, as a uh, desired capabilities plus you put the app in tester.com as your remote uh, web driver. So there's really a couple of simple steps and I I think we are pretty much covering this in a demo part but I'll explain what happens. So when you need a device you go to cloud.tester.com and you spot a device you want. So you get that name from, from any of those lists. Let's say iPad Mini 2 with all that details, what operating system and so on. You copy paste that name and you basically add that desired capability in your desired capabilities. You can use these user credentials, uh, your username, password, but you can also use the API key. Uh, you configure the project, test run, and device you want to run that test on and then you de define your application. So up in application context, you have to upload that to the cloud and then you know that test script will take care of everything. You also point web driver to the appium.tester.com and uh, that's pretty much that line you need to actually include in your test. Uh, then you just simply run the test. But when, once the test is executed, you actually need to fetch uh, all that test assets that came out of that device. So we maintain, while we are running those applications on these devices, we take screenshots. Uh, you can define, of course, by yourself when you want to take a screenshot. Uh, there's full logs available from those device runs, a lot of data really to interpret, and all kind of details results, uh, what actually happened during that test execution. So you simply pull it back using the remote, uh, again, with the desired capabilities. Okay, that's simple as that. If you want to run on multiple devices from client side, you basically need to have some sort of instigator script where you uh, define a device array, let's say uh, lots of iOS devices, you define it over there. Uh, here's a Python example where you uh, launch a test script.py uh, with the device specific name and it gets another test, another test, and another test executed on, on Tesla Cloud side. Server-side AppIM is much easier because you can basically uh, define everything manually also. So you can build and drag and drop the device group for yourself. So let's say I want to build a device group that includes only 9. something iOS version. So you can do that very easily and quickly and I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so let's look at the demo. So I'm going here on the browser. And um, here, cloud.tester.com, you log in with your user credentials. And this is pretty much the uh, first dashboard you see. So we have uh, your projects over here, but you can basically find everything here. If you want to have a remote testing session with any device, basically, you click this interactive. It gets um, in a wizard that asks you, do you have an application you want to install, do you want a certain session to or uh, service to run over there, and so on and so forth. Um, project side is basically means test automation. So you can build your own projects over here and you can run those tests uh, with the just configuring everything using the wizard that's available over here. It's simply four, four steps where you, um, let's look at the um, one of these test runs. So for example, this one. So you basically can click any of these test runs we have here. Uh, this is a demo example. So we click one here. Here's some something that failed. Uh, 
it gives you all the information of that those test runs. And you can click further information over here on any of these devices, and you get all that uh, fine-grained details from blogs, performance stats, um, you know, everything that you output it during that session, you get it over here in this view. And of course, the devices are really important when you when you come here at Tesla Cloud. So you might want to build some of these uh, um, device groups for yourself. Currently, we see 444 unique uh, Android devices over here. So you can basically, um, let's say I want to have the latest Android version here, or let's take some older one. Let's 5.111. There's a couple of those. So you can get any of these and you can build your device group here, giving a name and defining whether it's Android or iOS. And then you can just simply drag and drop um, your devices in that device group. So as simple as that. So now when you start a test run, you just simply show here on a project. And you basically go to the, um, let's say movies example here. Okay, it's empty. Uh, let's look at the um, demo here. So you basically want to start a new test run. So you click the plus button here, and this wizard comes to you open. You can first define your application. Okay, we already have an IPA example that Adam actually showed just recently. Then you define the test package. Um, it can be just zipped as um, Appium or any, any kind of framework type that can be APK, uh, zip file, jar file, or anything. So you just upload it here. We also have an um, intelligent crawler called App Crawler that actually goes through your application, tries to find issues, clicks buttons, and does things. Um, but we, of course, it's always recommended to use real tests when you, when you run a serious testing on, on your app. On the third option, you select the device group. Okay, we have uh, one, three iOS devices here. Then you click Next, and more options will come to you. At, these are kind of like advanced options. You can define the run names. You can uh, test time periods. Do you want to sch uh, schedule it simultaneously, all these devices, or one device at a time, or first available device only? These kind of approaches or uh, options are available here. You can also set some hooks here. Uh, if you want to have a use post get calls uh, when the test run is finalized, you can actually pull everything back using it. You can also uh, define the, some of the um, other configuration parameters here. And just simply click start so that you start a test run. So for example, this iOS demo now started on four different devices. Adam, I think that was pretty much my 20 minutes, so do you want to continue with the uh, demo we have from here? Yep, definitely. I'll do that. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, now it's probably better. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do next is that we're going to take the same test that we ran before, only we're going to run it on, use the same baseline that we had before with the with a Galaxy Note, but use it to validate uh, a different device in the test Testroid cloud. So, if we move to the uh, Testroid test, it's basically exactly the same test. The only differences are is that we are choosing a different device. This is uh, the name of a device in the Testroid cloud. We've changed the configuration of Appium uh, to include the Testroid capabilities. So you can see I'm specifying my own API key, um, indicating the device that I want to test on, um, indicating the project that I want, uh, that contains the application that I want to test and where the test results will appear, the version of the application, I might have a few versions uploaded in, in that project, and of course the name of the test as I want it to appear in the test droid uh, dashboard. And then again, um, the, major, the entire uh, remaining part of the test is the same, except for the fact that I'm configuring the ISIS SDK to run the test with layout match level. Because this device has a different form factor, what I want to do is just to make sure that it has the same structure and layout 
as the one in my baseline. So let's run this test. It will take a few minutes for it to, to run, but in the meanwhile, maybe uh, um, uh, Villa, you can uh, show how a test results uh, look in, looks in your dashboard until it completes, and I can show the Optitools dashboard. Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's go ahead. All right. So meanwhile, let's look what happened to this iOS device running. It was relatively short, but uh, let's look at the. Um, what happened to the uh, test run that Adam just started. So I have it hard-coded as a project here. I, um, I go into this Applet Tools test uh, project, and as you saw, okay, it's still running. Um, there's a couple of older runs we can look. Um, it, it typically really takes a couple of minutes, uh, this kind of test. Um, we're rebooting, cleaning devices before the session starts so that it's 100% clean device and an environment is as unique as possible. So for, for example, there's a lot of test runs going on so that nothing disturbs or actually causes um, issues on, on that app test. Okay, let's look at some, some of the tests here, um, some of the old one actually. So we have run it the same example, Bitbar sample app, and it was running AppBeamScript on HTC Desire. Uh, device it tells a bit about the installation time, launch time, execution took some some minutes over there, um, and while we click it, we get all the details of of this uh, execution on this device. So first screenshots. So as Adam showed, we um, during the session there was three uh, screenshots taken. You can actually see the same over here. Um, it doesn't, of course, compare this like uh, Apple tools tools are doing. So it doesn't give you anything, um, you know, how, how to really compare these issues you see. So that's why there's a fantastic um, fit with our tools and, and Tesla Cloud oh, tools and our Tesla Cloud to uh, make sure that you have a great combination of everything while you, while you're doing the testing. So we we can of course we can uh, look at these screenshots. Um, they are available here. You can also fetch those uh, via API to your local environment. Um, not only screenshots, of course, there's performance stats of uh, different time of that execution, what happened, what was the memory usage, what was the CPU consumption at any given moment, and these kind of things, especially with the games. Uh, this this is very simple app. Even the device is not the latest, but the it, it's very simple app. It doesn't take much of the CPU. Some of the very graphics incentive games, for example, they they seem to take a lot of a lot of CPU, and you can of course see that see that as battery drain and so on. You also get the logs. Uh, you can output your own logs as well if you want to put some uh, debug data or something. You get everything here, and it, this actually is a real time. When you run a test, you get the real time uh, data over here that you can actually interpret. And additional files if there's any log gaps, at being log itself and so on. So everything can be uh, can be found on this page. Yeah, that, that, that's probably the how, how it looks on, on Testroid Cloud End. Okay, so let's see how it looks like on the Apple tool side. Okay, so how our test is completed and passed. If we go to uh, the dashboard, we can see that it did pass. And inside it, we can see that uh, our baseline is the Google Nexus 4. Uh, the uh, screenshot is on our HTC device. And if we toggle between the two, you can see the different form factors. The fact that the paragraph uh, is uh, the word, the sentence is wrapped differently and the buttons here at the bottom are different, but then again, with layout matching, you can still verify that the structure is consistent and okay. Um, okay, so with this, we conclude uh, the demo part. Before we move on to the questions, uh, we have some special offers for you. So from Apple Tools, you can get Dave Hafner's Ultimate Visual Testing Guidebook if you sign up for a free account and uh, and forward it to webinars at applytools.com uh, to claim your free copy. And, uh, Ville? 
Yeah, on a Tesla cloud side, basically. So we are hosting um, lots of uh, free devices for Android and iOS. So if you want to see how things work and if you have a ready APK or IPA, and even if you don't have a test, it's uh, we have this app crawler thing that you can actually try out. But of course, it's always recommended to build those tests. So just visit testor.com and um, there's further information on how you can actually find those devices and how you can start testing, testing on these real devices. Excellent. So, Aidy, I think we're ready to take uh, questions now. Okay. So, uh, first of all, Adam, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, first of all, I want to say that there are a lot of questions and we won't be able to get to all of them uh, right now, but I promise that every question will be answered uh, via email, as I promised in the beginning. So, Adam, uh, first question to you. Uh, we have Alex that is asking what types of mobile applications ICE can work with, native web, hybrid, uh, for native Java-based, or Xamarin, C, Borland, etc. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the technology that uh, all the te image comparison technology and validation technology that uh, Appitools is using is based on image processing. So basically, as long as you can get a screenshot to validate, then we can work with it. It has, it is completely independent of the actual UI technology and device type. Um, our SDKs do make it easier uh, to hook into some of the platforms, uh, for example, Appium, and take care of all kinds of stuff like uh, scrolling and stitching, uh, uh, full page screenshots, waiting for screens to stabilize, making, taking the screenshot for you, uploading it, retrying, and all that stuff. But we also have SDKs in all the programming languages that just take bitmaps or PNGs uh, as input. So as long as you can get screenshots from your application and send them to Appitool's eyes, then you're covered. Okay, uh, great. So next question is for Villeveco. Actually, I think I have here two questions uh, uh, that are very, very similar. Uh, one person uh, asked, do you support parallel running of tests on multiple devices? And the other one asks, if you do not have dedicated devices, do you sometimes have to wait until selected devices are available? Yeah, great questions. Um, we, of course, support simultaneous test runs. So you can basically select, if you build your device group and you include whatever number of devices over there, when you launch that, uh, that test, you can actually specify whether it tries to run on all of those at the same time. By default, that's yes. So you get to run on simultaneous on, on all of those devices you have in your device group. The other question, um, uh, that was about the uh, dedicated, sorry, dedicated devices on the, or oh, sorry, the queuing system. So basically, if that device is taken at the moment, you launch a test. So you basically, we have a queuing system that basically allows uh, your application and test wait there until that device is ready for, for that session. So it will get there. Um, some of the free devices, of course, are quite consumed. Uh, they're heavily actually used all the time. Um, but when you have a dedicated plan uh, in use, you have a higher priority and you get to the um, in front of queue pretty easily. So, um, as, as I mentioned, we have a thousands of devices and approximately 400 something unique, 440 uh, unique Android models. So there's a lot of copies of these devices. So basically, we um, Galaxy S5, uh, for example, I think we have 17 copies of those, the devices that are really popular. So you really get the time um, on that device as soon as possible. Okay, great. So we have another question from uh, Gary, and he actually asked me uh, if both of you, Adam and Villaveco, could answer it. So Adam, you start. And Gary asked, which recognition technology do you use? So the image uh, comparison uh, algorithms that we use uh, were developed uh, in-house in Apitools for several years by our image processing experts. Uh, this is actually our core technology. Uh, we have uh, various algorithms that are put to use, uh, whether it's the strict matching algorithm that uh, can model uh, um, the 
type of differences that uh, humans are sensitive uh, and those that are not and ignores those that are not. The layout matching algorithms that al actually can decompose the structure of an image and then compare that structure and make sure that it's layout correctly. Um, take that which can handle like uh, subjective offsets and uh, size differences, etc. We also have algorithms that can perform automatic maintenance, meaning that if you have like uh, uh, a change that, that occurs uh, many times throughout your application, uh, uh, like a common example is a change to the footer of a website, then you only need to approve it once. And uh, by doing that, you actually eliminate the change from everywhere. So it's very easy to maintain. Similarly, if you want to ignore a region, it will automatically find all the other places where that region appears, so you don't have to put it in in various places. And uh, we continue to develop and enhance and build new algorithms all the time. That's, that's what makes us uh, special and distinguishes us as a technology company. Yeah, and from Testroad point of view, we host real devices and, and technology built around this is pretty much open, so we can pretty much support any kind of image recognition type. I think um, visual t testing that Adam showed has a lot of um, you know great potential really to um, change uh, testing in, in this industry. Other than that, there's of course template matching and, and OCR, some others that you know are already pretty um, common and, and popular when people do image recognition based testing on Tesla Cloud. Okay, so now a question for Adam. Um, Alex, Alex asks, if what if the tested application's UI does not fit in the window, um, which means the window needs to be scrolled? How does eyes behave in that case? So, um so basically, uh, as I mentioned, eyes work with the screenshot, and if you can get the full screen uh, screenshot of the full thing, it will work with it. But beyond that, our SDKs are capable of producing, of scrolling the uh, uh, the, the application page and stitching the the parts of the image that are visible through the uh, viewport and producing the full page screenshot. So when we have several techniques to do that that it actually can uh, handle all kinds of complex UI uh, elements like uh, floating uh, and, uh, and fixed components on the screen, etc. Okay, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Villaveco. I'm afraid this is all the time that we have. As I mentioned before, uh, every, every question will be answered via email. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar and uh, a recording plus a link to the slides will be emailed to you tomorrow. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.